What's up, Vineyard? How y'all doing? Man, it's awesome to be here. It's awesome to be here. Uh, I love your church, man. I love your pastor a whole lot, man. Uh, man, y'all are blessed. But do y'all know y'all blessed? Y'all are blessed. Or Yins is blessed. Is that how you say it up here? Yins is blessed? I've, I've, I've heard that. I, you know, I'm from South Carolina, so we say y'all is blessed. Um, that's horrible grammar. Uh, but anyways, I, I'm, I'm so excited uh, to be here with you this morning. Uh, the hope of this message is uh, that I would spread some hope on uh, the topic of addiction. Uh, because I know that in our world, especially here in Wheeling, uh, that that's a heavy topic. There is uh, lots of overdoses. There's lots of addiction. There's lots of hard things happening right now in our community. And I'm hoping uh, that this morning uh, that you will hear a message of hope and uh, that you will have an encounter with a God of hope uh, because he, he is hopeful. So here's our question uh, that I want to help answer this morning. This is it. It's going to be on the screens. What is the answer to addiction? What is the answer to addiction? Let's pray together real quick. Holy Spirit, I ask right now uh, that you would take over this whole service. I just pray right now uh, that you would speak and you would move in ways that only you could get credit for, God. Uh, this would not just be, you know, another talk or um, another church service or another just uh, empty time. And I pray that you would change lives and change hearts through your word, through your spirit. And I pray that you would save souls in this service right now. God, I pray that you would break the bonds of addiction in our lives and in um, the whole state, all of Wheeling, all of West Virginia. Uh, would you do a miracle this morning in some people's lives? And would you breathe hope into this church. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I have a story uh, that's a little crazy uh, that I want to share with you this morning. Um, I had a horrible speech impediment growing up. I literally could not even tell you my name, right? If you were like, hey, dude, what's your name? I'd say something along the lines of, <coughs> and as you can imagine, that was super awkward for me growing up. Right? Every interaction I had with another human was just super uncomfortable. I was super anxious all the time because I know I was going to be embarrassed every single conversation I had. At school was so miserable. Um, ordering at restaurants was miserable. I just had this anxiety that crippled me. But on top of that, I just had this hole inside my soul that I really didn't understand why it was there. I had friends and family members who were happy and were like enjoying life and stuff. And I could put on the happy face externally, but on the inside of me, I was empty. I had this hole in my soul that I didn't really understand why it was there. Um, eventually, about age 12 or so, um, I started uh, to make a choice that was like, man, if I'm going to live 80 years on this planet tops and I've got this crazy anxiety, this crippling anxiety and this hole in my soul that I don't know why it's there, that I'm going to spend my life trying to get as much pleasure from this world as possible. And I chase after all kinds of different things from sports uh, to popularity, uh, to pornography, uh, to girls, to all kinds of different things. And eventually I tried weed for the first time. And I'll be honest with you, I thought I'd found my answer at that point. I'm like, man, I, I am calm a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm whole feeling for a few hours. And I thought I was only going to smoke weed for the rest of my life. But quickly after that, I started trying harder and harder drugs. And I eventually became a heroin addict. I literally spent every waking moment chasing after drugs and trying to get as much heroin as possible. I was an IV drug user. And as you can imagine, everything around me uh, started crumbling. Um, had friends that OD'd and passed away, uh, family that split apart. 
and I hurt literally everyone around me. I had health issues. I had legal issues. I was, had all kinds of charges against me. I, I, I was literally a hollow human being. And I was trying everything I could do uh, to get out of it then. I'm like, okay, this is clearly my issue. It's the drugs. And I started chasing after um, treatment centers and AA meetings and NA meetings and literally tried everything I could get my hands on, Suboxone and Methadone and um, inpatient and outpatient and all kinds of different options of how to get off of drugs. Yet, I'll be honest with you, it didn't work. And I was at a point in my life where I was like, man, I, I don't even want to like live anymore because of how hopeless I feel. And eventually I hit rock bottom. I was out of options. I was out of money. I was out of resources. I was out of people who would help me. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll give life one more chance. And I checked in at this treatment center in Florence, South Carolina. Um, I mean, I was just hollow at that point. I was a hundred pounds. So same height as I am now, but half a human ago. I had track marks up and down my arms. I still uh, I could hardly talk. And I was ashamed. I couldn't look you in the eyes. And about a week later, I was invited uh, to go to a church service. And I wasn't raised in the church. Uh, I wasn't a guy that you know, had this you know, clear understanding of who God was. I was like, I don't even think I believe in God, to be honest with you. Uh, because if there is a God, you know, he's not very nice to me. Uh, because look at my life. But I was invited to go to that church service, and I thought maybe there's going to be cool music and pretty girls. Um, so I went, and that's probably why a few of you guys are here, uh, which is awesome. Welcome. Join the club. <laughs> uh, but I went, and, um, you know, I was just hopefully expecting uh, to hear kind of a hope-filled message that would hopefully help me that day. Uh, but I heard the gospel. I heard about a God who loves screwed up people like me. I heard about a God who could literally change my life if I gave him all the broken pieces, he could put it back together in his own beautiful way. I heard about a God who sent his son Jesus here to live a perfect life, to be crucified, to rise from the grave, and that if I place my faith in him, I would be made into a brand new creation. I mean, I don't think I understood everything uh, that the speaker was talking about. I probably only understood a small fraction. But I know that night I heard about a God who could change my life. And that night I placed my faith in Jesus. And I'm telling you all, nothing has been the same since. The hole that was in my soul, I got a taste of the pleasure I had been looking for for my entire life. And it hasn't all been easy and, you know, just, just kind of this happy-go-lucky life and rainbows and flowers and lily pads and all unicorns and stuff, right? It hasn't been that. I've had lots of ups and downs in my life and a lot of hard downs, yet I'm telling you, I have a treasure and I've got a joy and I've got a peace now that is unshakable. And that was eight and a half years ago. I haven't touched alcohol or drugs ever since. And I'm telling you, I have a joy that far surpasses and about three months after that I'm at another like small little church service thing and uh, the Holy Spirit whispers in my ear and says hey I'm gonna have you preaching the gospel one day and I was like <laughs> great idea God um, other than the fact that your boy can't order a hamburger literally can't talk at all. I'm, I'm never going to be able to stand in front of people and speak, especially preach in a Christian type of service. I don't have any schooling. I don't know enough. But he said, I made your mouth. I can do anything I want with you. And I'm here to tell you there is nothing that God can't heal and redeem and use for his glory and our good. It's awesome, right? It's a message of hope. Yet here's what I know is that that's not everyone's story. I know that for a room this size, especially in this part of the world, that we all have been impacted by addiction in one way or, or another, and some of us are right in the middle of it right now, either personally or with a friend or a family member. Every three minutes, every three minutes, a person ODs and passes away from drug addiction in our world. 
every three minutes. So let's actually try this. If you have ever had a friend or a family member or a friend of a friend who you know who's overdosed and passed away from drugs, would you throw your hand up? Man, homegirl got two hands up, man. She's, she's my type of people, right? Hey, guys, look around. There's so many of us here. You're not alone. Half of all people right now in prisons and jails are there through drug addiction, a charge related to drug addictions. So let's try this. If you've ever spent time in jail personally, or if you've had a friend or family member who has spent time in jail because of drugs, would you throw your hand up? Wow. All right, you can put your hands down. For uh, the first time in over 100 years, the... the um, expectancy of your life has gone down. Of a person who lives in the USA for almost 100 years, it's gone up and up and up and up incrementally, except for the first time in almost 100 years, it's hit the opposite direction. And that is mainly because of drugs and suicide. This is an epidemic of addiction, especially heroin, especially here in Wheeling, West Virginia. And so what's the answer? What's the answer to addiction? Man, there's a lot of people who claim that it's a choice. There's a lot of people who claim it's a disease. A lot of people blame the doctors or blame parents or blame other countries or blame the addict themselves. Science and politicians haven't found a clear answer yet. All the arrests, harsher punishment for drug offenders, all the war on drugs that has been going on for almost 50 years now has been a complete failure in a lot of ways. Counseling and the medicine in the world has fallen short. If we lock addicts up, the heart still longs, and at first chance, they will return to their love drug. If we get it, all the addicts off of heroin and harder substances through other substances, that void remains in our soul. What is the answer to addiction? And I know I have about half an hour to talk to you, and that's not going to explain all the intricacies of every single story, of every single case. Yet what I want to do is I want to give you a framework of how Scripture and how the Christian views addiction. I'm going to say, what is addiction through a Christian worldview? Two is what's the remedy for addiction? And then at the end, I'll give some practical advice to us. So here's question number one. What is addiction? What is addiction? And here's the um, response I'm going to give for that. I oh, mean, it's running that anything other than God in order to fill our vacancies, which eventually enslaves our heart, our mind, and our bodies. It's running to anything other than God in order to fill that hole in our soul that only God can fill. And eventually those substances or pornography or anything else that we run to other than God will eventually enslave our heart and our loves and our affections and our mind and our brain and also our flesh and our body. Here's what uh, the prophet said in the Old Testament. He said, be appalled, O heavens. My people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and two, hewed out cisterns for themselves that can hold no water. Evil in this, uh, the world, according to the Bible, is turning away from an all-satisfying God of the universe who is full of joy and peace and everything our heart longs for and looking at that beautiful God and saying, no, thank you, and turning to a needle, trying to find joy and pleasure there. 
evil in the world is looking at the beautiful God of the universe and saying, hey, I don't want you. I just want your stuff. I hadn't planned on telling this story, but I think I want to tell it. It's kind of like uh, if I was going on a trip, I have a beautiful wife. Her name's Kathleen. She's way prettier than me. It's the Beauty and the Beast type of story. Uh, I mean, she's, she's a rock star. Do we have a picture of her that we can throw up? I don't know if I had that for him. Look at her. God, that's the blessing of the Lord right there. Take it down. I'll get distracted. Uh, but anyways, um, picture this, uh, that I'm about uh, to go on a week-long journey uh, to travel and speak, and I hop up early in the morning. I've got an early flight, and I run downstairs, and I write a letter uh, to her, and I'm like, babe, I'm going to miss you. I love you so much. I'll be back in a week or whatever, and I leave these flowers down there. Um, and I kind of spray it with my cologne so it smells like me and all that stuff, right? So I leave, um, and she heads downstairs, um, and there's this awesome letter there. And she looks at it, and she reads it, and she's, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, my husband's so great. She smells it, right? She smells the flowers. Man, and she looks at it, and she's like, oh, my gosh, my, I, I love Chris. He's so, he's so good to me. I'm so blessed, right? All those things. I'm in a week later, all week, I'm, I'm so excited to go home and I finally travel and speak and then I come back in the door and I fling open the door expecting her to be running to me and homegirl is over at the table smelling the flowers and reading the card and she looks at me and then looks at the flowers and the letter, looks at me and just kind of hangs out over here with the card and the letter again. All of us would say, what's wrong with you? Right? The whole point of the card and the letter was to point you to your husband. Yet you have traded him for a lesser joy, a glimpse of who he is. And that's what we do with God. It is that he's given us so many beautiful things in the world, sunsets and rivers and family and jobs and food and coffee. I love coffee. Who loves coffee? Anybody like coffee? Come on, somebody. <laughs> and all of us have, have all these presents from God that are meant to point us to him, yet rather what we do is we turn away from God and we try to find pleasure and satisfaction and wholeness in the things he gives us, and it does not work. And eventually those things will enslave us. Uh, this smart guy named John Ortberg said this. He said, an addict is a supreme example of trying to satisfy the soul with all the wrong things. Oh man, the more it's fed, the more it craves. We were all made for a relationship with the God of the universe. And that's where living waters are. That's where real joy is. That's where real intimacy is. That's what our souls long for. Yet all of us have turned away from him and said, I don't want you. I want your stuff. And that's called sin. And the problem with sin isn't mainly that it makes you a bad person, but the problem with sin is that it separates us from the all-satisfying God of the universe. And we are left with this hole in our soul that all of us spend our lives trying to flood with all kinds of other things, but they fall short. People always used to say that I had a drug problem, and I said, no, 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 I have an emptiness problem. I have a drug solution it causes a destruction and a lot of death, except we don't care as addicts because it's the only thing that kind of makes us feel whole for a few hours. It's a seemingly hopeless condition where the only thing that sort of fills the void is the thing that's killing us. I remember uh, that I got in some legal trouble uh, when I was like 18 or so, um, and I was in all kinds of classes and stuff they were making me go to, and I lost my license. I went to the, uh, the opening class, um, and they said, hey, it's an eight-week class. All you have to do for eight weeks is come to class once a week and not use drugs or alcohol, and you'll pass. All your charges are going to be dropped, and you'll get your license back. Um, and you know, I think for a lot of uh, the people in that class, that was great news, 
right? I just don't have to use for eight weeks. Nailed it, right? I can do that. I'll get my license back. Uh, But I remember going home crying my eyes out because I knew that when I got home, I wasn't even going to make it three minutes because I could not stand that emptiness. I could not stand that hole in my soul. I had to use drugs. I had to. There was no option of just saying no for eight weeks. Addiction is running to anything other than God in order to fill our vacancies, which eventually enslaves our heart, mind, and body. That's what addiction is. So here's question number two. What's the remedy for this? What's the remedy? There's lots of answers out there that all kind of seem to fall short. Well, if the issue is that we are separated from God, and he's the only thing that fills our void, then the answer is that we need God. Is that we need that intimacy we, in our lives again. We need his presence to come back to us. Yet how do we do that? And I think for a lot of people, it's, hey, how I get God is I climb the ladder of religion. Right? If I can just um, hang out at church a little bit more, if I can read the Bible a little bit more, if I can do more right things than wrong things, then God will return and then I may be whole. Or, oh man, if I can just hit all the 12 steps and nail them exactly how they're written and really go after them as much as possible, and then I will ultimately step my way to God I love the 12 steps, yet they're incomplete. We cannot earn our way to God. The only way we can get God again is through the gospel. In every other world religion, it clearly says, climb the ladder of religion. Yet in Christianity, Jesus stands alone. He came down the ladder to get to you and I. We can't be good enough on our own, but Jesus was good enough for us. There is a God, and we were made to know him and to have that intimate relationship with him. Yet all of us have turned away. It's called sin. And he is a holy God. He is a just judge, and that means his wrath is on all sin, including addiction. Yet the best news in the universe is that he's not just a just judge, but he's also a loving father. And he loves you and I so much that he does not leave us in our hopeless states, but rather he sent his son Jesus, who was a real dude. Not Harry Potter or the Lord of the Rings or any of that junk. It's good, I don't know. (laughs) But he was a real guy. He's rooted in history. You read any history book, he's in there. He was a real guy and he came to earth. He lived a perfect life in our place and he hung out with the screwed up people of society when he was here. He hung out with the prostitutes and the strippers and alcoholics and the drug addicts. And Jesus spent time with the people that the religious system had outcasted and all the religious people hated him for it. They're like, he's claiming he's a prophet and he's hanging out with that girl. He's claiming he's the Messiah and he's hanging out with that guy. Does he even know what he did last night? And I love that y'all are a church that believes in that. Can I just say that? I love that y'all are a church that welcomes in the broken and the outcast and the homeless and the beat up and the drug addicts, y'all. That's how we're going to change the world. It's not by being more churchy. It's by reaching the lost. Come on, we can celebrate that. He spent time with the broken people of society, claiming he was God, claiming he has the words of eternal life. And eventually all the religious people had had enough. And he was arrested and beaten and spit on and whipped and flogged and eventually crucified on a criminal's cross. They literally drove spikes into his hand as he hung on the cross. And for years I heard that story and I was like, what does that have to do with anything with what I'm going through? I'm 18 years old and I'm a heroin addict. How does that old story of some old guy 2,000 years ago have anything to do with me? 
Here's how it has something to do with us. Is what he did on the cross is he took the payment and the punishment for everything that we've ever done wrong. He paid for the thing that separates us from the all-satisfying God of the universe. And through what he did on the cross, we can be reconciled to God again. And that hole that's in our soul doesn't have to be there anymore, but we can have an intimate relationship with God that's full of joy and full of peace and full of life. Yet he didn't stay dead, right? Easter, you've, you've heard of it, I think. He was put in the tomb. And on the third day, Jesus Christ didn't stay dead, but rather he got up from the grave conquering sin and death and everything. And the resurrection is proof that addiction doesn't have to have the last word. He literally called him up from the grave. He got up out of the grave and he's been doing that for 2,000 years ever since. He's been raising screwed up people from sin and death. I've had that experience. And scripture says that if you will turn from your sin, right, and say, I don't want that anymore, I want Jesus, and place your faith in him, all your sins will be forgiven. You'll be reconciled to God, and you will be made into a brand new creation. This, my friends, is the gospel, and here's the answer to addiction. It's Jesus Christ. The answer to addiction is Jesus Christ. Here's how Jesus explained it in uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 13. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a person in search of really fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and purchased it. This is what happens when you get saved. Is that all your life you've been searching for a pearl of great value Right? And you're like, okay, it's going to be found in this girl or in this relationship. Oh, it's going to be found in this sport or in this group of friends or in this career or in this amount of money. And you jump from pearl to pearl trying to find one that will fill the void inside of your soul. But you can't find it until you meet Jesus. And what happens in that moment is you see that he's not just an old relic in history somewhere, but he's rather the, he's the desire of your soul. He is the pearl of great value right there that you've been looking for. And once you have him, you will in your joy gladly go and sell everything in order to have him. That's the gospel. That's what happens when you truly meet Christ. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. He's a really, really smart dude. Uh, I highly recommend some of his books. But here is what he said. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but actually too weak. Oh, that we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Oh, man, we are like an ignorant child who wants to go on playing with mud pies in a slum, for we cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. Ultimately, what he's explaining there is that all addiction and all, all people really in general are like small children playing with pies of mud in a slum, acting like you're having fun. And at some point in your life, you're going to be offered the holiday at, at sea of, hey, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to jump from slum to slum trying to find better mud, but rather you can follow Jesus and be given the holiday at sea that is what your soul has longed for your whole life. The answer to addiction is not just say no. The answer to addiction is there's someone greater. The answer to addiction is not put down the substance. It's pick up Jesus. Because once you taste his presence, once you are fully surrendered to him and you have that treasure, you have that holiday at sea, you will gladly put the drugs down because you found someone greater. Here's what another really smart guy said hundreds of years ago. Speaking about God, he said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. 
Our hearts are going to be restless trying to find something that will satisfy them until they find their rest in God. A life of following Jesus is way better than anything this world has to offer. What is addiction? It's running to anything other than God in order to fill our vacancies, which eventually enslaves our heart, mind, and body. And what's the remedy? The answer to addiction is Jesus. And then lastly, practical advice. Practical advice. If you're here and you have a loved one, a friend or family member or a person in your life who's addicted, I mean, what do you do? I think as I travel around, that's probably the question I get asked more than anything is parents of addicts are just coming up saying, hey, my son or, oh, man, my daughter, they've tried everything. I don't know how to help them. Here's a few things that just encourage you. One is uh, to keep the friendship, a relationship intact, yet try not to enable them. I think oftentimes that parents or loved ones uh, will kind of hit one extreme other or the other. It's either, I don't want anything to do with you. Please leave me alone until you're sober. Or here's $100. Here's another $100. Yes, you can live with me. Yes, I love you so much and you're loving them to death. And the actual answer is somewhere in the middle of, hey, I am going to keep the relationship intact. I'm not going to go to this extreme, yet I'm not going to give you money. I'm not going to hand you all these dollars. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'll purchase a few things for you, maybe, but not giving you actual cash. Keep the relationship intact, yet try not to enable. Two is to pray for them and care for them spiritually. I really believe uh, the reason why I'm a Christian right now and, and clean and sober for eight and a half years is because I had some friends and family members who spent a lot of time on their knees for me, who just went back to God and kept knocking, kept seeking, kept asking and said, God, you, you can't let him die. You can't let him die. You can't let him die. And he, in his sovereign will, he, he saved me care for them spiritually, invite them to church, you know, uh, to not smack them over the head with uh, the Bible, uh, but love them and speak to them with lots of grace, seasoned with salt, pray for them a lot and care for them spiritually. Um, and then lastly, uh, the biggest thing I see with friends and family members of addicts uh, is that, uh, that they center their entire life and universe around the addict. Is that they're like, I don't need help. I don't need to care for myself because I'm caring for this person. And oftentimes you become just as much addicted as the addict because you're addicted to helping that person. It's great to help them. It's great to love them. Yet my advice for you is you got to care for yourself. You have to make Jesus the center of your universe. You have to make Jesus the center of your life or else all that you do for the addict will be in vain. That's uh, the first type of person I want to talk about. Second type of person is this. Hey, if you're here and you just want to make an impact, and if you're like, I don't have any personal struggles with addiction in my past, is there any way I can still have an impact on the hopelessness of this community right now? And the answer is yes. Uh, the person that came and got me from uh, the treatment center that night eight and a half years ago, he had no ties to addiction personally. He was just an old Christian guy that wanted to help some drug addicts. And he had no idea uh, that he was going to pick me up that night and I was going to hear the gospel and now tens of thousands of people are going to be impacted. Jesus can use you. Small steps like that of, hey, I'm just going to, you know, there's a homeless dude on the street. Hey, you want to come to church? I'm going to pick him up. Kind of weird, but I'm just going to do it. You have no idea what could happen through that. I'm going to have another friend uh, that it was probably a month later or so uh, that he started having a Bible study. It was at his house. He had a huge house, and he just said, hey, uh, he asked the rehab center, 
uh, do you mind if I come and pick up about 20 guys and have them over and just kind of open the Bible with them? I mean, he had us over. It was super sketchy, man. All of us were in his backyard smoking cigarettes. It was, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, it smelled bad. He probably had, you know, it was, it was awesome, man. But he loved us and he opened Proverbs. I don't remember one thing he said to me. All I do remember is his love and how he cared for me and how he opened up his house uh, to us and stuff. He's one of my closest friends. Uh, out of this day, he's on the board of directors of our ministry and stuff, man. But you can make an impact. It's small steps, small prayers that eventually added up through a whole community, all the Christians in the area, man. It can flip a city upside down for the gospel. And then here lastly, if you're here and you are personally struggling with addiction, and you're like, man, I've tried it. I've tried the rehabs. I've tried the meetings. I've tried everything I can get my hands on. And I'm still addicted. I still crave. I'm clean maybe, but my mind is constantly on it. I just want to encourage you that there is something better. You have no idea what your life could look like in a year from now if you surrender to Jesus. Here's what the scripture says in Acts 3. It says, repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out and that times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. That's Jesus' invitation to you today. Repent and believe in the gospel. And I'm telling you, that hole in your soul, you'll get a taste of the pleasure you'll be looking for. It won't always be easy, but it will always be worth it. And then after that, plug into groups here, man. Plug into the church. Come here, every, you have too good of a church here to only come once a month. That's everyone. This, this place is incredible. You get great teaching every week, man. Jump into the church head first, into small groups. You got small group signups. Jump head first because you can't do this alone. We need each other. All of us need each other in order to follow Jesus. And then lastly, utilize other means that are out there. Man, once you get saved, a lot will start to change, yet there are great resources like counseling and like rehab and like um, small groups and meetings and stuff like that that I would highly recommend you utilizing as a result of the heart change that happens through the gospel. I had to get out of my city. I had to leave Raleigh. I had to get out of there because there was too many connections. There was too many people there, and I left. And I never came back. other than preaching the gospel every once in a while to come at churches and stuff. So it's cool, man. But I'm telling you, drastic measures are needed for this. I, mean, I want to close with one last verse. And it's not just, uh, just written for the addicts in the room, but written for all of us. Because here's the thing about the gospel. It's not just for the ones who are addicted. It's for all of us. Heaven and hell hang in the balance of what we do with the gospel. And you may be here and you've never touched a grug yet that hole in your soul is still lingering. Here's Jesus' words to all of us, Christian and non-Christian. Here's what he says. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus' invitation to us this morning is not to try harder or to do better or to do more. Jesus' invitation to you this morning is come to him because he will give you rest. Let's pray together real quick, and I want to give you a chance to respond to what we've just heard. Heavenly Father, do what only you can do right now. All the messages in the world, all the funny stories, all the music, all the lights, all the cool buildings, everything, that can't do what we need you to do right now. Only you can. Only you can change a life. Only you can save a soul. And I pray right now that you would do just that. With all heads down and all eyes closed, if you're here and you know that today you need to respond to the gospel, that maybe uh, that you are addicted, or uh, that this is your first time at church ever, or possibly that you've been here years and years and years and just have never really placed your faith in Jesus. 
Um, and hey, if that's you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer here in a second, except it's not the prayer that saves you. It isn't, all right, if I get all the words right, then I'm a Christian. No, no, no. It's the faith that's behind the prayer that saves you. I mean, it says in the Bible that for God so loved the world, he, he so loved you that it's, he sent his son Jesus. Oh, that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. If that's you, you can just pray this in your heart quietly. He's, he's here among us. He's listening to you. He knows every thought you've ever had, and he's going to hear the prayer that you pray to him. The Bible says everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So, hey, if that's you, just pray this quietly in your heart. Heavenly Father, I need you to save me. I know I'm a sinner, and I know I can't save myself, but I believe that you can. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. I repent of my sin, and I place my faith in you, Jesus. I surrender it all. With all heads down and all eyes closed, if you just prayed that and you meant it and you're like, man, I'm, I'm, I just gave my life to Jesus, and then I want you to throw your hand up in the air and just in a symbol of, hey, I'm surrendering to Jesus. I just placed my faith in him. Would you throw your hand straight up? You're not the only one. Would you leave it up for me in order I can see it? If you mean it, hold it straight up. There's some halfway hands up in here. Come on, throw them straight up. Awesome, awesome. Oh, would you leave it up for me so I can, I can count? I love to count. I think it's cool. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Y'all, 29 people just responded to the gospel. Come on, somebody. Woo! That's awesome. The scripture says that heaven throws a party over one sinner that repents. I mean, imagine what's happening right now in heaven over all these fools that just repented. Isn't that awesome? Heaven's throwing a party. Man, let's celebrate one more time. Now it's our turn to celebrate. Heaven's throwing a party. We're going to throw a party here. Um, and oftentimes the uh, relationship with Jesus is, is kind of like getting married. Uh, that when you pray the prayer and you say, hey, I'm surrendering my life to you. It's kind of like a wedding service. Uh, but at my wedding uh, with my beautiful wife uh, that I tricked into marrying me somehow, <laughs> at the end of the service, uh, we had to put a ring on our finger, right? I got a cool one. It's black. Um, and and the, the, there was this end of the service where it's like, hey, I'm going to let the world know what's happened in my life today. Right? In all the places I go, it's Stay away, all the other girls, right? This is a symbol of stay away. I don't have many that want to talk to me, but uh, if they did, it's a symbol of staying away. Uh, but this is what we're about to do here in spontaneous, uh, spontaneous baptism, is that we have an opportunity uh, to go public with what's happened in your life now. And if you're here and you just responded to the gospel, this is a way you can go public and say, hey, I'm going to show the world I'm following Jesus now. And if you're here and you're like, I don't have a swimsuit, I don't have a towel, we got gotcha. you. We got all that stuff in the back for you, swimsuits, towels, um, I don't even know what else, underwear, I think, all, all kinds of different things. Uh, robes, look at these robes. You get a robe, I think, if you get baptized. That, that's awesome. Uh, but a lot of people have already signed up, um, and we're going to probably spend 20 minutes or so here uh, just celebrating together, hearing some more music. And if that's you, if you're like, hey, I just prayed to receive Christ and I want to go public, 
That's your next step. And you can head out the back doors as I hand it over to the band and we can celebrate all together. Y'all, Jesus just did incredible things. Now I want us to praise the Lord as people go public here. I love you guys. I'll be back out here in a few minutes.